Hi, I'm Joel Bloom, president of New Jersey Institute of Technology. At NGIT, we believe that not only our students, but all citizens need to be informed about the issues facing higher education. As New Jersey Science and Technology University, NGIT is proud to support the important programming produced by the Caucus Educational Corporation and their partners in public television. Funding for this edition of One on One with Steve Adubato has been provided by Wells Fargo, Horizon Blue Cross Blue Shield of New Jersey, making healthcare work. The New Jersey Education Association, working for great public schools for every child. New Jersey Council of County Colleges, New Jersey Manufacturers Insurance Group, auto insurance, homeowners insurance, and banking under the principle of stewardship. PSENG, committed to improving New Jersey's economy and strengthening its communities. And by Verizon Communications. This is One on One. When you first heard that they were doing Charlie Rose and Gail King, didn't you go, what? People like laughing at others, so I don't mind if the other is me. You see, you go you right into the character. That's what it is. <laughs> I'm bringing families together a half an hour each week. Man, I'm doing something special. And so I do feel successful. Like that? Yeah. Hi, I'm Steve Adubato, but more importantly, everything you wanted or needed to know about money, you're about to find out. Okay. Yeah, well, you better have it because you're <laughs> okay. the one we have here. Lori Sacker. I'm under pressure here. The okay. author of The M Word. The money talk that every family needs to have about wealth and their financial future. Thank you for joining us. Oh, thanks for having me. Why is the M word such a hard word to actually not just say, but talk about? What's up with families and money? Well, money is a taboo subject. It's a cause of strife in U.S. households. And there are a lot of factors that interfere. So when you ask why is it difficult, so there's issues just below the surface, such as control and trust and, and not having enough not having enough <laughs> right and right. then there's another set of factors that go more psychologically deeper how about money yes psychological by the way you should make it clear that you do have credentials here tell folks about your credentials okay well okay people are like who is she to be talking about this let's go okay so i'm a senior vice i have to give my title senior vice president of morgan stanley wealth management oh stop bragging okay okay <laughs> no, and, uh, what else? and i'm a i'm a cpa a cfp and a certified investment management analyst a lot of alphabet so letters, I, I, like I have that. a lot of licenses yes i'm of, impressed so but what do you mean the psychological stuff it's just money well it's very psychological so let's talk about some of the factors that are hidden below it's uh, gender marriage politics age, attitude, family history, culture, evolutionary instincts, behavioral patterns, and even the language that people use when they talk about money. Language. So I try to explore the factors and help people understand them and overcome them in the M word. Okay, so here's the thing. Mm -hmm. I have some friends. <laughs> you like that? Yeah, I start like that? it. Start with a story. I have friends, okay. which some people may actually find hard to believe in and of itself. I have some friends who um, just refused, guy friends, who do not talk to their significant others, you know who you are, they do not talk to their wives or their significant others in a serious way about money. And their attitude is, that's my responsibility, I won't talk to them about it. And then inevitably, they wind up in these very difficult financial situations and they, it just gets worse. And I say, are you gonna talk to her about it? Right. And then it's too late and bad things happen. Lots of tension and some of those people aren't together anymore, you say? Yeah, so in marriages, you know, money is the central theme. Is and, it? Well, I thought yeah. it was sex. It's, well, that, okay, so they're tied together. Th what? <laughs> well, Wait a minute, hold on. <laughs> money and sex are tied together? Well, let me explain to you. On an evolutionary, it's instinctual getting more complicated. level, Good. money is tied to sexual exchanges that were part of money transactions in primitive societies. And as a res result, money and family are unconsciously linked and equally uncomfortable to talk about, and they're connected with a fair amount of angst and anger and fear and lots of emotions. And if, you know, when entering a marriage, it's important to have the money conversation before. Wow. And full disclosure is the objective. And because I find that when families, when marriage when partners don't talk about money, it's a sign that there may be other problems going on as well. You decided to write this book um, for a lot of reasons. Right? You've been talking about money for a long time. In what venues have you been talking about it? Well, I have many roles. Yes, I'm you a, do. I'm a mother, and I'm a, um, a, a wife, and a financial advisor, and in a lot of, and, and, a, and a friend as well. 
And as I started to see, um, I started to witness uh, in all my different roles, families and their finances being torn apart. I was seeing finances disrupted across multiple generations because there hadn't been proper planning and communication around money. And when I started to do my research, I saw that my little nucleus of the world is part of a much bigger picture. There's a 70% failure rate in transferring wealth across generations. It's a worldwide statistic. And the breakdown in communication and trust is at the heart of these failed transfers and loss of money and family harmony. But break that down. Yeah, I was confused so, by that. So in transferring wealth across generations, right. in 70% of the time, um, what happens? There, well, what happens is a failure is defined as loss of control of assets through mismanagement, poor investments, or the like. And oftentimes it's, it's eaten up through litigation and conflict. So, so uh, for example, conflict. say there are siblings, mm -hmm. and they start arguing over assets of the parents, whatever, and they're not communicating clearly, and they go to litigation. A lot of that money gets eaten up because their inability to communicate effectively well, I think it goes, let's go back a little okay. bit. It actually starts with the family and the way the estate plan was created and the way that the, uh, the family members who were transferring the wealth. Um, they did it in secret. Well, they didn't talk about it. They didn't do, there wasn't proper planning We don't talk about money in our family. Right. Right? Right. There was, and there was no, and, and oftentimes there's no discussion and there may also not be any real planning. So, um, and that becomes a real problem. But, but devil's advocate. Mm -hmm. I mean, I tell you before we get on the air, my wife Jennifer and I are, are very open with each other about, about money. Um, I think it's great. But, uh, well, because it's my second marriage. Mm -hmm. and <laughs> you learned. Yeah, and I don't want to have yeah. a third. Uh, so I learn a lot about the way we communicate about things. And that doesn't mean we see things the same way about money, but it's just very open mm -hmm. in that way. Um, but here's my point. Sometimes there's a part of me that says, this isn't a lot of fun. Mm. It's not very sexy mm. to talk about money, to talk about estate planning, to talk about life insurance, to talk about sending the kids to school, to talk about what it takes to do those things. But what? Well, if you don't, you run the risk of not only losing the estate um, that you've spent time building and managing uh, in the transfer to the next generation, but you could create a lot of conflict between various family members. So people who do this right, there tends to be plenty of communication, mm. lots of preparation, uh, opportunities, targeted times to talk to family members, to prepare them, to educate them, so that there can be a successful and smooth transition. And that's what I'm really, it's my goal, is to help families keep their finances and their family members and the relationships intact through all of life's transitions. But you also believe that, that that it's very hard for individuals to do this themselves, and you do need some outside help. Yes. How do you get really good outside help? Well, I liken it to picking your medical advisors. You know, people go to great length to find the right doctors when it's a serious issue. And I feel that expertise is required in whatever, with whatever transition point you're dealing with in life. Finding the right team of experts is really critical. So I spend a considerable amount of time helping people pick these right, in, uh, these right advisors, and I provide some tools, some questions, some guidelines, so there should be plenty of due diligence and uh, interviewing, asking the right questions. But you want to figure out which are the advisors you need, depending on the circumstances and the, the issues that you're dealing with. You're talking about people, before I let you you're talking about people who have the kind of assets that would require them to have financial advice, no, or is it anybody? Not necessarily. I say regardless of economics, really? size configuration, gender composition, that these conversations need to take place. Now granted, the larger the estate, the more complicated and maybe more professionals required, but the conversation is difficult regardless of whether or not you have $10,000 or $10 million. Doesn't matter. It doesn't matter. And the kids are going to fight over it, and they're gonna, there's going to be conflict if you don't prepare for that transition you know, wisely. The, the M word should not be so taboo. Thank you. The M word, the money talk that every family needs to have about wealth and their financial future. Lori Sackler. And the website to learn more information, themword.com. Themword.com. Hey, thank you, Lori. Thank you. This is great. No, stay right there. Don't oh, run. Don't oh, run sorry. Run. You want to get out of here so soon? No, I thought you were done. I got questions when we get off the air. Oh, okay. So, we'll be right <laughs> I'm back happy. right after this. Okay. <laughs> thank you. Oh, I'm sorry. If you would like more information on this program or if you'd like to express an opinion, email us at info at caucusnj.org. 
Visit us online at oneonone.org or find us on Facebook at facebook.com slash PhD. There she is, Gloshin Salam, and she is a graduate of community education centers. Technically, you're an alumna, which is the female version of an alumnus. Did you yes. know that? I just found that out right now. I did. Uh, thank you for joining us. You're welcome. Uh, let's put community education centers in perspective. Our good friend uh, John Clancy started this organization, and uh, Delaney Hall is one of their um, locations. It is, an, it is an alternative to incarceration. Okay. Your background is very interesting. Um, 2007, put things in perspective for us. Your life was in turmoil. Yes, it was. Drugs, prostitution, domestic violence, facing 22 years in prison, potentially, correct? Yes. And what happened? Um, January 3rd, 2007, um, I would like to say rescued and not arrested. Hmm. Okay, I was rescued and um, I was taken to the Essex County Jail. It was there where I learned about CEC. The Community Education Center. Right. And um, I was excited, you know. I was hearing all of the things that the programs had to offer. They did uh, skits. Um, they had the GED program. Different education groups. training. Right. So um, it wasn't jail. Right. It wasn't jail. It was different from jail. So I signed myself up for four months straight, for four months. And every time they came to do the roll call, they wasn't calling my name. You know. But you wanted in. Right. So I just kept signing up, signing up until one day they called me to go. And what happens now? Because you. Now you're facing the 22 years, but are they saying if you go to this alternative, your, the outcome could potentially be different for you? No. But, okay, but you want this other opportunity because what do you think could happen for you? Because you're, you're in the, your life's in chaos though at the time. Right. But what did you think this could do for you? I basically needed to learn how to live again. I needed to know how to come back to myself. You know, um, I just needed to, to get me some, I don't like to call it tools, I like to call it armor. Armor for life. Right. So describe Delaney, what goes on there. De By the way, we have any pictures we can show here, team? Um, as you talk about Delaney, talk about what's going on there. Okay, well. Because I've been there, there are signs up on the wall that, that are motivational, inspiring, and, and, yes. and aspirational, a whole bunch of things. So describe what goes on there. Yes, the walls definitely talk to you. The walls definitely talks. Um, well, just to give you a, a brief description of how a day goes there, you wake up early in the morning, you tighten up your beds, we do breakfast, you have a meal movement, um, then you have it's a little break in between, that's the time when you clean up and everything, and I'll say about 45 minutes after that, you go into morning meeting, mm. and morning meeting is where you hear about daily events, the horoscopes, you know, a thought of the day, word of the day, and then a skit. Okay, that the residents will put together. Um, then after that, it's different groups that go on. What about the signs on the wall, though? Some of them ever grab you? Yeah, my favorite one was take the cotton out of your ears and put it in your mouth. Say that again? Take the cotton out of your ears and put it in your mouth. What did that mean to you? Um, it just basically meant you're here for help, so allow the help to help you, and not you tell the help how to help you. Can't the help were the counselors. Right. Describe those counselors. Uh, phenomenal. Why? Phenomenal. Um, they just helped me come to some truths, you know, that I was in denial for a long time. G give us an example of what you're in denial of and how the counselors at Delaney helped you see what you believe to be real. Um, for example, um, during a period of time, the way I was living my life in the streets, I was in denial about the certain, a certain way I was soliciting myself. And they helped me come to the realization that, no, that's, you know, prostitution. And, you know, and um, I was in denial about the word no. Yeah, I just, at that time in my life, I could not accept the word no. And um, they helped me realize that no can be good and it can save your life. You know, so. Where'd you grow up? I grew up in Newark, New Jersey. How tough? Tough. Tough. I was a fighter. Define what that means. Um, I fought. 
I fought. For everything? Pretty much. Over yeah. a lot of things? Yeah. Over a lot of things that made no sense in retrospect? Right. Did you put your life on the line, you think, in those situations? I did put my life on the line. I did. So you're in Delaney for how long? 13 months. What do you think it did for you? It did a lot for me. Delaney Hall, okay, because I did 13 months in Delaney, and um, ultimately I received a four within 85, so I had to go down to Etna Mahan. Well, that's a lot of jargon we don't get. What does um, that mean? So what happens, because we don't understand what all that means. What, a four with 85? Yeah, what? I'm supposed to know what that means? Okay. <laughs> <laughs> a four with an I'm 85. I'm in the system, if you will. Okay, I'm okay, sorry. Okay, what does that mean? A four with an 85 is, um, I did basically did three years, six months, and 22 days. Got it. Okay? And um, when I got down to the prison, all of the armor that I received from Delaney Hall, it was just there on me. It was just there. And because of the things that I have learned from CEC, from right. Community Education Centers, I received no infractions. I knew how to deal with, you know, different situations that came up. In and, jail. Right. So now you were prison. ready. Right. And it wasn't only about fighting. Right. It was about other ways. Right. So you serve some time. Yeah. And then you go to another CEC facility. Right. What's that called? Bo Robinson. Bo Robinson. Is that yes. set you up for halfway? Right. It's an assessment center in Trenton, New Jersey. And um, there's that. Is that what we're looking at right now? Um, yeah. 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 You get assessed there. They assess your behavior. They monitor you, you know, and see how you're coming along in your process. Mm -hmm. Yeah. You know, what's so interesting to me is I would talk to John Clancy about this. Um, someone like yourself just doesn't have a positive uh, experience like this but you're still connected, you give back. Yes. You're part of uh, a team of people who graduate, if you will, as an alumna. Yes. But you're still part of the team who gives back. How do you give back? Um, what I do is I go back out into the community. I talk to children in the schools. Mm. We also go back into the facilities. Uh, we go to um, Hoffman Hall, which is in PA, um, Bo Robinson in Trenton, and all of the other um, facilities that are in Newark. And we go back and just let the residents there know, the future alumnus, mm. know that there is life after the use of drugs, after incarceration, that there's life. There's life after that. I also do um, new employee training where the new employees that are coming in, I go and I speak with them and I let them know how important their role is, you know, there in a the facility. You're proud of what you're doing? I'm very proud of what I'm doing. I have a passion for it. I love it. We're proud of you. Thank you. Glosheen Salam from the Community Education Center is a graduate who's doing great work. I want to thank you very much. Yes, thank you. Thanks we for appreciate having it. Me. Anytime. Stay right there. This is Steve Arabato. We'll be right back right after this. If you would like more information on this program or if you'd like to express an opinion, email us at info at caucusnj.org, visit us online at oneonone.org, or find us on Facebook at facebook.com slash Ph.D. Dr. Reginald Farrow is Research Professor of Physics at the New Jersey Institute of Technology and JIT. Good to see you, Doctor. It's great to be here, Steve. You know, in preparation for this uh, interview I was saying, you're trying to create the world's smallest biofuel cell. And you said, yeah, but that's not exactly it. And I'm like, I'm saying, no, I'm going to ask you what exactly you're trying to do. So go ahead. Well, what I'm trying to do is make the world's smallest electrical probe. And the best way to, to, to get an idea of why, we, why I would want to do that, um, the cells in your body are like little bodies in their own right. I mean, they have a skeleton, they have function. They well, hold on, back up. The cells of body? The cells inside your body. Yes. Okay, go ahead. So if you wanted to study your body, you'd want something smaller than that in order to figure out what's going on. Well, I needed something smaller than the cells in your body to study them. And then the, 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 the question became, well, how do you make something like that? Right. And so I came up with a way to make a very, very tiny probe. Um, and along the way, I figured out ways to make it functional. 
uh, to make it be able to detect not just electricity, but be able to detect interesting things like glucose, and that's where the biofuels are. What do you mean a in. probe? It's just a little tiny wire. That's, that's really all it is. Okay, so show us, because you brought something in. Uh, this is the whole thing, but the actual part that's interesting about it, I could fit seven of them inside a, uh, your human hair, inside a diameter of a human hair. Say what? I could fit around seven of them inside the diameter of, of a human hair, yes. So it's, and then the probe itself is even smaller than that, is a hundred times smaller than that. And tell us from a, a layperson's perspective, if people are trying to understand the value, the benefit of this, mm -hmm. give us a sense of just a couple of the specific benefits that would be derived. Well, could be derived. The, the best example that I could give is, you know, there are, a lot of, there are a lot of times when you want to know what type of cell is there, like is it a normal cell or is it healthy, is it sick, um, is it a cancer cell. Um, there's some cases where you'd want to know, well, how are the cells getting along with each other? What do you mean? They communicate. And so you'd like to know, well, how well are they communicating? How are they sending signals back and forth? Well, let me deal specifically with a disease. Say you're talking about cancer. Mm -hmm. What could, what you're talking about, these incredibly small microscopic cells, what could they tell us? Well, in the simplest way, in the simplest you know, uh, application, they could just tell that the cancer cell is there. Beyond that? Beyond that, um, you could probably figure out how fast they're reproducing. Uh, beyond, and that's beyond what we know. Beyond what we know right now, it's it's something that we that we can do now in a way which is a lot slower than I'd like to be able to do it, and a lot of people would like to be able to do it. How and why did you become fascinated with this? It was the, one of the most interesting measurement problems that I knew of, and I came to this from being a physicist, not a biologist. A physicist. Yes. Go ahead. And it looked like one of those measurement problems that was out there that could use some state-of-the-art nanotechnology to solve. And so I actually left uh, physics in the way I was studying, the way I was doing research before, to do physics and with a biological, uh, you know, concentration. And so I had to learn cell biology. For those of us who have no idea what you're talking about, um, <laughs> what are you talking about? <laughs> I'm being serious. You go to a cocktail party and mm -hmm. someone says, you know, so how'd you get into this? And you say what you just said and they go, but I don't get it. And they ask you to break that down with a for instance or a for example. I Meaning you were studying physics in a certain way. Yes. And that wasn't getting it done for you. Yes. And you wanted to take your background and do what with it? I wanted to take my background and apply it to a very interesting measurement problem, a problem that could actually help people's uh, health. It was the, the thing which actually turned me on was I saw that um, people were trying to make something called an artificial retina. An artificial retina? Yes. That was the thing that you were into? That was the, what got me involved in the first place. Okay. It's, this is something to replace the retina in your eye. And I looked at that and, and, and realized that that would be something very difficult to do because you, could, you needed to make contact with the parts of your eye that actually go to the brain. Wow. And I said, now that's a hard problem, but I had an idea that I think I could offer something to that. And along the way, it just became a general interest in how do you make contact to cells? because the cells are the things that communicate that information to the brain. And, uh, and it eventually got to a point where I said, the problem is interesting, but then how do you make it? And it was beyond the technology that we had at the time, and so I had to develop new technology in order to realize what I wanted to do. And uh, as in many cases in, in, sci in scientific research, we got lucky. Well, I don't know about luck, but uh, <clears throat> a team of people that you work with at NJIT, describe them. And what, what is a team of scientists like who come together on a project like this? That's, and that's what is your conversation like? 
and could the rest of us be a part of it? <laughs> I know it's a loaded question, but I'm, I'm realizing now that a group of people who are so smart and so smart in a particular way and communicate in such a unique and precise mm -hmm. and specific way that the rest of us would feel lost. But it's, my, uh, it's a long-winded way of getting to this. What's it like being with these people? Actually, NGIT is a very uh, fertile place for doing research. Um, the people there are very talented, and they're willing to talk to you. Um, they're willing to uh, talk about things which they know about, but they're willing to, to learn things that they don't necessarily know about. And that has allowed me to put together a group of people who have very diverse interests, because you have to be able to touch in a lot of areas in order to make something like I'm trying to make and study the things that we're trying to study. Um, and what we try to do is speak in language that everybody can understand. And it's not just the people who, do the, who, who are the scientists, it's the students themselves. Mm. And so we have to speak in a language that the students can understand too. And we have students ranging from high school up to you know, people who have recently gotten their PhDs, and everybody needs to understand what they're doing. So we have to always break this down. You're always breaking it down? Yes. So communication is a huge part of what you do. Humi communication is everything about what we do, I would say. It's understanding you know, what's out there and being able to, to know. We have to communicate in order to know what to do. You were born to this, do this work, weren't you? <laughs> Well, I kind of decided to do it when I, was a, when I was a teenager after seeing some work that was being done at Bell Labs. And I set a goal at that time yeah. to come to Bell Labs and work, and I did. Well, I'm glad you're doing it. Yeah. And hopefully uh, I'll get better at understanding it. Thank you, Doctor. Well, thank it's you. good stuff. One-on-one on One with Steve Adubato has been a production of the Caucus Educational Corporation, celebrating 25 years of broadcast excellence. Funding for this edition of One on One with Steve Adubato has been provided by Wells Fargo, Horizon Blue Cross Blue Shield of New Jersey, the New Jersey Education Association, New Jersey Council of County Colleges, New Jersey Manufacturers Insurance Group, PSENG, and by Verizon Communications. Promotional support provided by The Star Ledger and NJ.com, and by the New Jersey Business and Industry Association. Transportation provided by Airbrook Limousine. One on One with Steve Adubato has been produced in partnership with St. Joseph's Healthcare System. New Jersey is a leader in solar power, and PSE&G is doing its part. With 24 solar installations in New Jersey, projects that are giving landfills new purpose and turning former brownfields green, solar powers more than our homes and schools and businesses. It powers our economy by creating jobs right here in the Garden State. PSE&G, proud to support New Jersey.